Thank you very much. I'm going to give you a very brief overview of what I think is the most exciting area in science at the moment. Uh, and it's linking some old-fashioned ideas with some modern ideas. Uh, and this whole concept that food can be medicine. Um, oops. So the last 25 years, I've been uh, working with twins. Uh, we, I set up the uh, UK Twin Registry, which now has 13,000 uh, identical and non-identical twins. And we've looked at hundreds of diseases, found thousands of genes, and uh, looked at how similar na nature and nurture, and also interested in some of these differences. And looked at obesity and the genetics of that, and also genetics for nutrition. But none of this um, vast array of work done by my team of 70 people has prepared me for what happened about 10 years ago when I got a, um, a health episode about 10 years ago at the top of a mountain. It left me trying to answer questions about what is the best diet to eat, what should I do for my own health, what non-pharmaceutical methods are there. And when you go to the internet, you think, well, this should be fairly straightforward. The governments must have sorted this all out. And it turns out that nothing is further from the truth. It's a lot of rubbish out there, and a lot of it hasn't changed for 20 years. Most of the websites are completely out of date, and uh, people are stuck in this uh, dogma of nutrition, which traditionally has been uh, probably the worst uh, taught in medical school and uh, throughout pretty much every country in the world. Uh, we learn much more about scurvy than we do about obesity still in medical schools today. Uh, these bits of these rare uh, nutrition disorders, we learn nothing about what we should be eating. And as a result, there's very little consensus on many issues uh, about saturated fat. Um, we'd be told to eat more starch. Uh, we should eat all the time rather than intermittently. Whether alcohol is good or bad in small amounts, whether we should be giving food supplements, are artificial sweeteners good or bad for us? And of course, this central dogma of the government policy is that we should uh, eat less and run more. Uh, all of this has led to us getting fatter and fatter over the last 30 years in pretty much every country in the world that's had this uh, idea that this is what we should be doing. Now, there are a lot of reasons for this. It's a very tough area. It's a modern uh, discipline. Um, and there's also the big hand of industry here uh, that's been manipulating all the ideas that are filtered down to these nutrition departments and really focused what they're allowed to work on. And experts in this field rarely change their opinions, un unlike uh, other areas. People just, once they said, there are, you know, I'm a fat person or I'm a, uh, a carb person, they just don't change. And the other reason it's all gone wrong or we've got so misled and confused is we really ignored the new science that tell us we have a totally new organ in our bodies that can explain all of these discrepancies, and that is called the microbiome. Now, what is the microbiome? It is these 100 trillion microbes that live inside our bodies, which are the same number of cells we have uh, of our human cells. And you need to think of it as a virtual organ, as a community of these microbes that are all chemical factories. They're producing a lot of the chemicals that we use in our bodies. Um, these are key to controlling our immune systems, uh, as di breaking down our foods to different amounts. Uh, they also um, allow us to release neurochemicals that can control our mood, that make a difference between us being happy or being sad, and actually being, uh, having appetite or feeling full. And we've totally ignored them. We've just tried to eradicate them for the last few years, zapping them uh, with antibiotics and sterile wipes. But actually, they are our friends. And the other thing about them is that we all are completely unique. Every one of you will have your own unique set of gut microbes. You share 99.5% of your genes, but probably only about 25% of your gut microbes. And that gives us this amazing individuality. And this has also explained to me why identical twins with the same genes do not develop the same diseases. They don't go on and both get uh, cancer. They don't get 
motor neuron disease, MS, rheumatoid arthritis. And this is the key difference. And this is why we're all so different and why really one size does not fit all when it comes to nutritional advice. Now, the microbiome is what I've been interested in the last uh, few years. And it's, you can measure it very easily now with genetic testing, the same way that we, uh, this genetic revolution about sequencing, just as we sequence our own human uh, DNA, we can sequence that of our microbes. It's just many more of it, and it's computationally more complicated. But basically, now we can do this, and you can do these things for under 100 pounds, get a full uh, sequence of all the bugs in your body. And each one, each bug, as I said, we're all different, so it's very hard to say there's one bug responsible for any particular disease. But the, the unifying thing that we do know when you look at all the studies of all the diseases we've looked at so far, and we've perhaps looked at over 50 or 60 diseases where we compare one group with the disease and one without, is it, there are some universal features. And if you take someone who's sick and they're overweight, they've got diabetes, they've got immune problems, their gut microbes are very non-diverse. There's not many species there. Their contents of their gut will look like an Arizona backyard, rather desolate. It's very easy for other uh, weeds to take over. Whereas if you're, you're thin, you're healthy, you're exercising, you don't have these chronic diseases, just like you guys, um, your microbes are going to look like an English country garden. Okay? There's all kinds of different species all working together. The soil is rich. It's, everything's integrating in these amazing communities that help each other. And that's the way to think about these. So high diversity, means uh, healthy and less likelihood of disease, and the reverse is true. And when we look at the range of these diseases, this is just a, a small list of them, all of them have this in common, that if you have those diseases, those conditions, you have less of these beneficial microbes. And that means you're getting less of these chemicals being produced that in general are beneficial, because that gives us this greater flexibility to deal with these, these problems. And the way you can increase your diversity um, is through diversity of diet. Okay, so studies we've done on 11,000 people comparing the US and UK show that people who can eat 30 plants a week will have the sort of maximum diversity. And that seems to be one of the most crucial things running through this. And the things that uh, our diversity of our diets, as our quality of our diets has deteriorated the last 40 years. We're eating more rubbish food, more processed food, and this is one of the reasons that despite having 30,000 items in our local Sainsbury's, we're only choosing the same uh, prawn cocktail salad uh, sandwich every single time, and I'm all guilty of that as well. So that's the, that's the key take home there. But the other point about our microbes is that they don't just metabolize food, they metabolize any chemical they come across. And we now know that they will interact and give a different result for a whole, more than 50% of all the, all the drugs tested so far. So whether you respond to paracetamol or not has, is, depends on your gut microbes. Antidepressants, key whether uh, your microbes are, play, are, are there or not, and we know that um, uh, treatments aimed at your gut microbes will have an equal effect on that. Now, anti-cancer is really important. Um, this is in the news this week. Immunotherapies are curing many cancers, but you can have a fourfold difference in your response to that drug and life or death, depending on your starting point of the diversity of your microbes and how much fiber you give them. And there's a whole list of other ones, including immunotherapies uh, and everything else. So absolutely crucial. Um, this interaction with all the things around us due to this new organ. Now, we wanted the first to do a large-scale study in this country um, where we looked at 3,000 of our twins, looked at their gut microbes with this sequencing method, and we, looked at the, we found that it wasn't very genetic, but we also looked at certain twins that were sharing uh, were different. And I've been fascinated by identical twins where one uh, is overweight and the other one uh, skinny. There's, they're not 
many of them, but they really tell a story because you're adjusting for absolutely everything else. So whatever is there, it's not genetic. And when we looked at these, these twins, we found that the, the skinny twin always had more beneficial microbes, and as well as the diversity. There are a couple of them that kept popping up, this Christensenella microbe and this Akkermansia microbe. And when we put those uh, microbes that we found in humans into sterile mice, we could stop them getting fat. And there are now a couple of food companies out there using this information to try and uh, put these into foods and sprinkle it on your cornflakes in the morning. They haven't succeeded yet, but it just gives you an idea of all the exciting potential there is in the gut microbiome uh, through either the microbes themselves or, crucially, the chemicals they produce, which I think is where the action is going to be. And it turns out that they don't just protect you against uh, putting on weight, but it's central fat and metabolic fat that they seem to work on through mechanisms we really have got no clue about at the moment. Now, microbes need fiber to produce uh, a particularly beneficial chemical that's really important for the immune system called short-chain fatty acids. And that's why fiber is important in our diet. That's why one of the things we can all agree on is that we don't have enough fiber in our diet. In general, we should be having 30 to 60 grams of fiber. The average Briton has about 15. Now, what happens when you lose fiber in your diet, you can start, the mic different microbes come out and they start to nibble away at your gut lining. And this happens actually to a small extent every night when you're starving because we have these circadian rhythms and a small amount of that is good because you get this acomantia one that's associated with um, uh, staying thin. These ones are come up at night and then when food arrives they get kicked out of the way and they move on. So our bodies are totally changing all the time. Now as part of when I was researching my book about five years ago I, uh, I did a number of self-experimentations. I did six weeks of being a vegan uh, while I was touring the US, which was probably the worst experience of my life. <laughs> Having artificial cheese pizza in an in a, in a, in a, in a, in a American uh, airport. Um, and the next test, uh, and then I did the uh, French cheese diet, which uh, was having for uh, three days to just only eat unpasteurized French cheese washed down with a bit of red wine. Um, <laughs> First day, fantastic. I was ready to write a book about the French cheese diet. <laughs> day two, mm, not so good. By day three, I definitely had enough cheese for the week. Um, so the next challenge I'd give myself was to uh, have 10 days of eating only at McDonald's to see the effect it had on my gut microbes. And as you can imagine, I was really looking forward to this. Um, but it turned out that there was uh, someone else uh, who was able to help me um, uh, who uh, actually, like McDonald's, he was hard up for cash. Um, uh, he was a student, and he also happened to be my son. <laughs> so he said, great, we're going to do this. Um, uh, fantastic, and I can write it up as my science project. And, but, and this is what he, all his meals were at McDonald's. Uh, he wasn't able to do anything else. And he came back after four days, uh, and, he, and he said to me, Dad, I'm really not feeling very good. Uh, the novelty's worn off. Um, you know, I'm starting to feel a bit sick. It's, it, my, my studies uh, are being affected. You know, can we call it a day? And of course, as a concerned parent, I said, no way. <laughs> We're going to publish this in the Sunday Times, which is what we did. Now, <laughs> so he did the full 10 days, and um, he didn't feel well. But the, the main finding of that was that he lost 40% of his gut diversity in that time. And even worse than that, two years later, he'd still lost it, despite me sending him food parcels and other uh, free gifts to go and get salad from the um, store. So it, he has regained it now, uh, but it took several years for those gut microbes to recover. It just gives you an idea of why so-called junk foods might be bad for you, may mean nothing to do with the fat and the sugar, maybe a lot of these other uh, factors in there, that include things like these artificial sweeteners and these chemicals and things like this. Now, um, what can you do to, to help your, uh, yourself? Now, we all know greens are good for you. There are certain ones that have 
particularly chemicals that are, are microbes like, things with inulin in them, uh, and that includes things like um, the leek family, the onion family, the garlics, um, particularly artichokes, globe artichokes, and Jerusalem artichokes are the number one one. Uh, and that's not surprising because, as you know, their nickname is also fartichokes. Um, but they are obviously much better than an iceberg lettuce, which is completely worthless. So we need to learn more about our greens and how we uh, deal with them. Uh, now, um, legumes are good. And there's also a whole range of other foods here that I haven't got time to go into, but things like nuts and seeds, things like uh, coffee, um, things like dark chocolate, um, olive oil. Well, we were all told 20 years ago these were bad for us because they contained fats. We now know that opposite is true and they are actually good for us. And the reason is they contain something other chemicals called polyphenols. And this is again part of this rather new science that's emerging. And polyphenols can't be used by our body, but they are rocket fuel for your microbes. And when you have those polyphenols, they will then produce these uh, other chemicals that, that help our immune systems, etc. And this is one reason we published uh, a couple of weeks ago uh, a rather controversial paper saying that red wine uh, was the one alcoholic drink that actually increased your gut diversity. And we did this in three populations. Uh, and we believe this is because the very high polyphenol content, which are of this chemical, this antioxidant chemical in the red grape, uh, and the red wine, because the grape is in longer contact with the wine. And you have to drink three times as much white wine to get the same benefit. <laughs> it's one way of saying it, but this is statistics, you know? But uh, uh, I was discouraged from, from saying that before, but you're a sophisticated audience. Um, and it could be that artisan cider is also, uh, also good, but that hasn't been tested. So extra virgin olive oil is also really crucial. And of course, we've got all these other fermented foods which are good for you, and uh, kefir and kombucha, as well as yogurt, as long as it doesn't have any of these artificial sweeteners or other chemicals which are really bad for your gut microbes in processed foods. Um, Personalising your diets using microbes um, is now possible. Uh, everyone's different, as I said, and so our response to foods is uh, looking very different. I've tested myself and my blood with a glucose monitor you can now wear for two weeks and will soon be commonplace uh, in your watches uh, within five years. I get massive spikes with uh, orange juice or grapes, whereas uh, my wife has no similar response at all. And we're all told we're the same. And, you know, this is all complete rubbish. So we've started to look at this more closely and we've just completed the largest ever um, nutritional intervention study of 1,100 people, mostly twins, involving our, ourselves here at King's and also at Mass General in Boston. And this is, I can't go into the detail, but it was a two-week study where we give standard foods and are able to log their own foods. And you look at their gut microbes, you look at the blood before, trying to predict um, how people will respond to food. And it turned out that um, we found twins where one responded to sugar, the other responded to fat in completely different ways. These are identical twins. These are clones. Okay, so this could be quite crucial about why one gets a disease and the other one doesn't. We're just seeing a snapshot giving people identical foods. And if, if identical clones respond differently, what about all you guys? Why should you follow the same advice when you're so different? And this is what, by doing this uh, study at, at, at huge scale, uh, with 32,000 muffins, uh, over 2 million uh, glucose rings. Uh, you, you can ask me afterwards why they're blue. Um, uh, we're, starting to do, we're doing machine learning, and uh, what this is telling us, everyone is completely unique, even identical twins. About, there's an eight-fold variation between people's responses. Genes are only a small part of the picture, and the macronutrient composition of these foods only explains perhaps less than a third of what we thought. And with this app that is now being developed with our, uh, the, the company funding this study called Zoe, uh, we can get a 73% prediction on how you respond to some new food. So this is extremely exciting. Um, now going back to our gut microbes, if you, you got the wrong ones and you want to change them, um, these might be for you. These are, are dried um, fecal uh, samples, um, which 
the Americans call crapsules. <laughs> and basically, you get them from a healthy person and you put them into a diseased person. And it sounds rather primitive, but it is the number one treatment for a very nasty gut infection called Clostridium difficile that kills about uh, 1,000 people in this country and over 10,000 in the US. And it's now curing everybody. It's also used for ulcerative colitis and is as good as immunotherapy in, in ulcerative colitis. It's also being used in autism. Uh, and people don't all respond, but there seems to be a small percentage of people that will just get an immediate uh, benefit from this. It's been used in MS and all kinds of other diseases. We don't understand it at all, but there's lots going on to try and work out what the main uh, microbes are that's driving it, or perhaps the, the chemicals that those microbes produce. So it's an extremely exciting um, area to work in where really everything is up for grabs because we don't understand the mechanisms, but with these effects are really big. Um, so to sum up, you need to tend to your microbial garden uh, really to heal yourself. And to do that, food is the key. And understanding that microbes are the key to your uniqueness you need to feed them all with the right probiotics, fiber, and polyphenols. You need to realize the potential um, that they have and the food you feed them have for postponing aging, changing your mood, your brain, and personalizing diets. And above all, encourage diversity of everything you give them. And remember, hopefully this will change the way you think about food, that if you remember that with 100 trillion microbes inside you, you'll never eat alone again. Thank you very much.